All right, here we are with a very important interview. Jeffrey Tucker, the editorial director of the Australian Institute, uh, sorry, the American Institute of American Research, author of a couple of books which we'll talk about later, also an affiliate, a uh, research affiliate of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, who we speak to a lot on this program. Jeffrey, welcome to the program. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. I think you're the first uh, people I've talked to from Melbourne since the lockdowns occurred. So it's really, it's my, my sympathies to you. And, uh, you know, I hope my article helped uh, to some extent. Well, that's exactly why we've got Jeffrey on the program this morning. Now, Jeffrey wrote an article that you might have seen uh, about uh, the, the lockdown. He's been a major critic of the lockdowns around the world, and he wrote a piece last week called Madness in Melbourne. Now, out of all the places in the world, what was it that made you write about Melbourne, Jeffrey? Because I effing love Melbourne. I mean, I've been there twice, and I love the city. I think it's beautiful. I'm, You know, when I was there, I had a sense that it was like New York without the cruelty, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, everybody was nice. Uh, I love the bridge. There's a bridge there in Melbourne with uh, lovers hanging keys or something. You remember that one? And the skyscrapers, I went up to the one of the highest skyscrapers and went up to the top bar and the top floor and had a beautiful cocktail called the Panda where you had to eat the chocolate, you know, uh, and smell the, the eucalyptus leaves at the same time it like, and look out over the city. It's like everything about Melbourne I, I, I adore. And mostly I was impressed by the public. Uh, sector aspects of Melbourne culture. The police were so nice. Every time I would get lost, I'd do that a lot. I would walk up to a, a policeman or, uh, and, and say, how do I get here? And the policeman would always say, oh, here's the way you do it. And I'd say, thank you very much. And they'd always say, no worries, no worries, no worries. And I remember feeling a sense of like, like this is the way a city should work, you know? Um, I loved being there. There's been many times in my life where I imagined myself moving to Melbourne. So when I saw um, the horror that had become Melbourne in light of the, this p- pandemic, um, I was shocked. Like I, ca- I kind of even understand how in a civilized country, something as ghastly as what you've experienced um, has happened. And I must tell you, I wrote that article because many uh, Victorians had, uh, that's what you call yourselves, right? Victorians, uh, had written me and said, saying that they are afraid to speak out because the police now have the authority to just knock on their doors and arrest them uh, or, or fine them for not being home, for failing to arrest them. And, and even the police chief of Melbourne uh, promised on international television that he would smash the windows of any car uh, that refused to unroll them and tell them why they were out and about. So um, my sadness uh, towards that situation is what led me to to write and and ask this fundamental question: Are we really willing to throw out all rights and liberties and everything that's special about Melbourne all because of um, the appearance of a virus that um, you know is a common thing in the whole of human history for a new virus to come along? We manage it through medical purposes, medical reasons, not through public policy. And I, and I felt like I needed to say something on behalf of all the people in Melbourne who are now imprisoned in their homes uh, under a, a police state regime that is literally d- destroying the civilization that I um, have loved. Yeah, the actions of uh, the government and then the police over the last couple of weeks certainly uh, is brutal. But your criticisms go further than Melbourne's lockdown. I mean, Melbourne's lockdown is probably the harshest in the Western world at right as this moment, but your criticisms are also for the American style and for the British uh, approach as well. So what were your criticisms of the lockdown approach more generally? Well, I don't think it contributes anything to disease mitigation. When, it, when a disease is here, we need to let it uh, uh, medical professionals deal with it. We don't throw out everything we've learned over the last 1,000, what, maybe 3,000 years of human history um, because of a, a new pathogen. Uh, we, we let our professionals uh, deal with that and not empower our public uh, officials to, to do strange things to us, and, and strange they are. Um, in Melbourne, you've been locked in your home. Well, in New York, two thirds of COVID cases uh, have been contracted at home. You know, so like, uh, has Melbourne learned nothing from the c- catastrophes uh, that we've experienced in the United States? Apparently not. You, you know, I don't know who this guy is. He's got a really sort of really sweet name. He's like Dan Andrews. Am I saying that right? And 
Dan Andrews. How could you be a bad guy with a name like Dan Andrews? And yet he's become a pretentious, pompous, uh, uh, seeming know-it-all who, who imagines that he can just issue these dictates, you know, day after day. And, and it reminded me, his behavior reminded me of many ways of American governors who have done the same thing. You know, they just woke up one day and said, all right, shut your schools, close Broadway, you can't go to the movies. Uh, you, you have to stay inside. Well, wait, can I stay inside at a restaurant? No, there's COVID inside there. So when we opened up, we can't go in restaurants. Now we have to just stand outside restaurants. And we can, now you can go shopping for clothes, but you can't try them on because there's COVID on those clothes. And, and, and three months ago, there was COVID on plastic bags. So no, there's COVID on paper. No, there was COVID on <laughs> bags you brought from home. And then, uh, and then a few months later, and so you have to use plastic because there's no COVID on plastic. Three months later, now the plastic is banned because there's COVID on them and you have to bring a bag from home and so on. Like it's, I went to a restaurant the other day, they couldn't even give us salt and, pa pa uh, salt and pepper shakers because they say there's COVID on them. So like, these governments are making things up and they're making us crazy because they're changing their minds every few days. And, uh, you know, we're dealing with a serious issue of science, you know, namely a medical uh, pathogen that is, uh, infects uh, the human body. Uh, human beings have done a million year dance with viruses. We have a thing called immune systems and we figure it out. We figure it out one person at a time, one medical professional at a time. I don't see what lockdowns have to contribute to that. Fortunately, I'm not alone. You know, there's been many studies trying to correlate uh, lockdowns with um, death rates and infection rates, and you wouldn't be surprised to know the result. There's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. There seems to be no relationship whatsoever. The disease does what it's going to do. The virus does what it's going to do. Mostly it achieves herd immunity and then becomes almost harmless, which is what's happened uh, in Sweden, it's what's happened in the Northeast of the United States. Sweden stayed open, Northeast of the United States shut down. Virus doesn't care about your public policies. So when I saw what's happening to Melbourne happen, I thought, my God, are you not reading the medical literature? Are you not looking at the newspapers? And you know, here's what's remarkable to me about Melbourne in particular. Here we have uh, one of the, possibly the most civilized place on the planet Earth. You know like a level of uh, graciousness and politeness, um, like I've rarely experienced as American, and the level of education in Melbourne among the population, very, very, very high, uh, a rich culture of uh, manners, politeness, and human decency all around. And even under those circumstances, in a, in a flash, practically overnight, uh, you imposed a kind of totalitarian police state where everybody was under threat, even to speak out against it because you feared doing so. To me, that is brutal, inhumane, and indecorous, and massively inconsistent with what Victoria is all about. And I, I felt like I had to say something about it. And I hope that Melbournians and, and Victorians don't believe the propaganda, uh, you know, I mean, to my mind, like if you're an American right now who's smart, you would turn off the television, right? So I'm, I'm pretty sure that needs to happen uh, in Victoria too, because the news media has been slavishly uh, repeating the lines of, of these governors, these pretentious uh, know-it-all governors who have no hesitation in putting guns to people's heads and telling you that they think they know what's best for you when, when they don't. So I, I think there's a funny way in which American culture and Australian culture mirror each other um, politically and culturally. Like, I think overall you're superior, by the way. <laughs> but but and I, I just see it happening there. You know, I see the same things that we went through like three months ago, you're going through now. And I, 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 I hope desperately to make some kind of minor contribution to stopping it. Well, that's interesting, Jeffrey, that you talk about that connection between Australian and American culture because we did want to talk about that. One of the things that has sort of depressed us a little bit is the extent to which that people have just absolutely accepted the government uh, completely controlling their lives. And we were sort of thinking that maybe that was less the case in the United States. Did that depress you as well, the extent to which people were just happy to give up their liberties um, and, and the pace at which that happened? Or were you more optimistic about that? 
Well, you know, I must tell you, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. And, and the reason I'm not sure is that I don't trust the public opinion polls. You know, when a pollster calls your phone and says, do you support the lockdowns? What are you going to say? You're like, well, sh sure, 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 sure. <laughs> so, so, right? So I think there's a poll in Australia that 96% of Australians support the closed borders between states, right? 96%. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure because, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the, the problem is when they stop gatherings, when they, when they arrest you for being out, and in fact, there was a protest in Melbourne the other day, not even a protest, a planned protest. And everybody who's planning the protest got arrested, all right? So if you're prevented from even expressing your point of view, um, how can you really discern what the mood of the public is? I'm not entirely sure that we know for sure. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I can speak to the American question. Um, okay. I'm certain that more people acquiesced to the propaganda than should have. Um, they've been bombarded with propaganda, people forced home, they turn on the te television, they listen to the fake news, you know, day in and day out, repeating a, a bunch of propaganda. Uh, without any kind of medical understanding at all. And uh, yeah, they've more Americans have gone along than I expected. But I also think that we're about to experience a huge blowback. After all, we do have a Bill of Rights, we have a Constitution, we have slogans in American history about how we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. We sing songs to freedom. The only thing American culture has going for it is that we're devoted to freedom. Everything else sucks. And, 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 and we have Broadway canceled. We have baseball canceled. We have bars canceled. You know, all the things that are essentially American have been abolished in the United States of America. You think that's going to work? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that over the long term, Americans are going to put up with this. And, and one of the reasons I think the lockdowns are continuing is that the political class is panicked. The minute they take the their hand off our throat, we're going to scream, and we're going to lunge at the political class. That's why they're so afraid to end the lockdowns, because they're afraid of the reaction. They've lied to us. Uh, they've, they've violated our rights. They've destroyed our economy. They've prevented us from traveling. Uh, they've even stopped travel within the United States. That is a human right, as far as I'm concerned. It's a constitutional right. They got rid of all that uh, willy-nilly, based on an executive dictatorship without ever having asked legislatures any more than uh, Dan Andrews asked uh, Parliament, right? So this is dictatorship. We don't like it. And I think that uh, Victorians are going to wake up at, soon, as Americans are already waking up right now. And they, uh, the political class and the ruling class right now is terrified about what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like, but it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree. I just think people have had so many liberties and so many of the things that they enjoy in life taken away from them. I think this is going to instill like this newfound love of freedom and newfound uh, desire to go out. And a lot of even the, you know, before COVID, all of the nanny state regulations around the world, the, I think a few of them will go away because people are just, why is that there? Like, why can't this bar be slightly bigger? Why can't this bar allow me to stand up right now? Uh, anyway, I want to talk to you because uh, at the American Institute for Economic Research, obviously, you do a lot of economic research and the effect of lockdowns around the world is going to be very heavy on the economies of the world. So what do you reckon is going to happen to the global economy over the next, like, not even six months, but six years? If, if, the, if the lockdowns had ended four months ago, I think we would have uh, bounced back pretty quickly, despite its egregiousness and despite massive disruption of supply chains. Not to mention the fact that we have a, 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 a U.S. president understands apparently nothing about economics. You know that um, our GDP on an annualized basis collapsed one, one third uh, in the second quarter of the, of the of, uh, this calendar year. And instead of doing something about that, he just imposed tariffs, new tariffs against aluminum from Canada. So this guy is a madman and he's bested only by his opponents in Congress who are even more insane than he is. So um, I'm expecting um, a huge blowback against this, but here's the problem. This stuff has gone on too long, too long. Um, we're now in month five of, of insanity. I think the, the devastation is going to be palpable. And uh, Sidorus Paribus, I expect we're going to be dealing with this stuff for 10 years. 
Like, I don't know what you do with three trillion dollars in new debt or two trillion dollars in new uh, money creation by the Federal Reserve. The fact that the Federal Reserve is now involved in policy and buying municipal bonds and buying stocks and buying index funds and um, violating its own charter. Like, I don't know what happens. Uh, um, I think they're going to have to. I think three months ago, we, this stuff was like reparable damage. Uh, now I'm afraid that it's going to be extreme and I'm not sure how we get out of it really. So I'm very actually worried for the future. And I say that as a man who's like wildly optimistic, you know, on the other hand, let's say, let's say tomorrow, uh, the United States, Melbourne, the UK, Brazil, um, everybody wakes up and says, all right, that was dumb. We had a medical issue. We should have let the uh, medicine man deal with it, right? And we deregulate the economy, open up uh, world trade, uh, stop the inflation, stop the spending, and uh, let business do what business does best and let people be free uh, to travel, to immigrate, to trade. I think under those ideal conditions, we could clean up this mess within uh, two or three years. Um, but those ideal conditions, I'm not sure there's any scenario I can imagine under which this occurs. Um, let, let me just say something really quickly about what I've learned throughout this whole thing, um, which is that if you read uh, Albert Camus, um, his great book, The Plague, which I highly commend to you, actually, it's a brilliant, brilliant work. But he says in there about the plague, when the plague comes, um, the plague does what it's going to do. And everyone imagines that, uh, that every government imagines they can control it. Actually, everybody believes they can control it. They can't. And he said, in light of that, everybody acts in a very stupid way. And then smart people like you, you, and you, and you all think this is stupid. It, it, it can't possibly last. And then Camus says, but stupid always lasts much longer than you think it can. So I feel like that's the stage of history we're in right now. It's the stupid stage, and it's going to last a lot longer than we believe. It's actually incredible that you bring that up, because my dad texted me those passages last night as he's reading it, as is my sister. So I really need to get my hands on this book. So <laughs> everywhere around me, it's just telling me to read this book. Um, <laughs> Another thing we're seeing in these global lockdowns is a resurgence of modern, uh, modern monetary theory. So the ABC, Australia's national broadcaster, they've been airing uh, segments uh, on economists supporting it. The US has printed more money in June than the whole first 200 years after its history. So what is modern monetary theory for our listeners that don't know what it is and why is it so dangerous? Well, modern monetary theory is what you might call a monetary theory that um, rejects monetary theory. Okay, so <laughs> that is very it should be called the, yeah, it should be called the anti-monetary theory theory, you know, because uh, they reject basically the equation of exchange. They introduce all kinds of postulates. That, the, the conclusion of which is that, you know, oh, we should be like Weimar. That's going to work out beautiful. Um, and uh, they think that because of 2008, where the Fed created lots of new resources and nothing really happened, they learned from that and said, look, we can, we can uh, fuel the economy forever with uh, monetary money creation. And um, it's, it's mythological and actually anti-modern and anti-scientific. Uh, but these people are vociferous. By the way, it's a tiny cult. It's like a dozen guys, right? So a dozen people. But they're very um, uh, sophisticated on Twitter. And they say things that, that the left wants to believe, which is that endless prosperity is possible out of the printing press. And, uh, and so therefore they've achieved a certain level of fame. And unfortunately, if Biden gets elected here, he's, he's surrounded by these MMM, MMT people and that the, so inflation, the hyperinflation becomes a real danger. You know, inflation has been mostly under control in the Western world since about 1980, mostly. Um, but for a variety of reasons, um, but there's nothing to repeal the laws of nature going on here. And, and if we're not, we're not careful, we could create a, another Weimar very, very quickly. We have to remember that the Central Bank of Germany in, in 1918 and 1919 and 1920 didn't intend to uh, entirely destroy the Reichsmark. 
or destroy society or usher Hitler into power. It was something that happened accidentally because of uh, really bad management of the printing press, right? It was a civilized country, more or less. Still, you generated a hyperinflation that, that tore through society and utterly ripped uh, the shreds of the social fabric and unleashed a kind of nihilism that led to the rise of dictatorship. So, yeah, th we should learn from that history and not pursue that path. MMT apparently knows nothing about this. Okay, Jeffrey, let's get on to something a little bit more optimistic. You've written a book. You've written a lot of books as a world-famous uh, economist. Now, I want to talk to you about one of them. The market loves you. Why does the market love you? Why is the market a force for good and benevolence in the world? Uh, the market is about human connection and about about all of us finding value in others and through that exchange, finding value in ourselves. Um, that's the whole book. I mean, it's just a celebration of human exchange and commercial society, uh, which Benjamin Constant said is the, the very essence of what we call modern freedom, you know, in his great essay that he wrote uh, in the uh, early 19th century. The difference between the liberty of the ancients and the moderns, in the ancient world, liberty was just a matter of your political rights. In the modern world, liberty becomes about your commercial freedoms and, and the fact that you have the freedom to ascend in the social order and, and acquire things and spend money that the ancient world never believed in. We broke down hierarchies and, and we developed uh, um, affection for each other. Um, I, I opened the book with with uh, with the description of C.S. Lewis's own theory of four loves, uh, the lowest level, which is basically a, a, a friendship with strangers, you know, right? Which you experience in Melbourne every single day. Um, when you go up to a hot dog stand and buy a hot dog and, and she says, thank you. And you say, thank you. All right. That's a beautiful mutual gift giving exchange. And then that moment you felt a human connection with somebody because they're, they've done something for you. You've done, you've done something for them. And there's an element of magic to that. And the book uh, gradually unfolds in this way. Let's go through all of our commercial exchanges, our coworkers, our, our bosses, uh, uh, the company that we might work for in the future, the way in which I value myself um, more than I otherwise would, the way in which the disgruntlement we feel in life is quite often because, comes because we feel undervalued, right? That's, I think, the source of all disgruntlement in life is we feel undervalued. Uh, the market unleashes our value personally and allows us to express the way in which we appreciate others. Without the marketplace, we wouldn't have this opportunity. You certainly can't do that through the state. And think what's happened to your own personality since you've been locked down, right? I mean, Zoom is cool. It just doesn't quite do it, right? You need to be there with people, uh, looking people in the eye and seeing that dignity is universal and that we all have the capacity to contribute to each other's lives. That's what commercial society unleashes. Uh, that's why I think it underscores uh, dignity, humane values, and ultimately becomes the source of, of, of love of ourselves and love of others and love of life. You know, God knows since the lockdowns, we've learned a lot. The world has become a much more hateful place, you know? Melbournians ratting each other out. Oh, I saw a guy walking out there. Please come and check him out. Okay, that's rude. That's evil. That's wicked. Why would you do that to me? Right? I'm a fellow Victorian. Why are you doing that to me? Well, he doesn't love you anymore because you're, you're, you're trash to him, you know? You're just an opportunity to, for him to express his political virtue. That's what happens when you get rid of commercial society. People, people begin to hate. Unleash commercial society, let people be free and people discover how to, how to love and, and how to value life and how to live a dignified life. And we learn about manners and, and ways of being that ennoble ourselves and ennoble other people. So I, yes, I wrote this before the lockdowns came down. I'm glad I did because I think it's a, I think it holds up as a kind of a tribute to what we're missing right now. 
You also raised something there that I really want to touch on because a lot of the criticism of free markets and people that believe in the free market is that we're obsessed with economic output and we only see people as uh, their economic worth. Whereas I've, I've always felt socialism is much more of that mindset. I mean, even breaking down from each according to his ability to each according to his need is literally you are your economic output to others. So uh, yeah. is that something that you would agree with? Yes, I mean, Marx's theory was called dialectical materialism, which was basically dial you know, materialism plus Hegel, uh, meaning that the sum total of who we are comes down to like, I don't know, what we own or our social position or what we can pillage from other people or what we can get. Uh, that's not true. You know, I mean, uh, under a liberal philosophy of society, uh, uh, we, we recognize a broad complexity of life itself and that... I don't care how much money is in your bank account. If, if, if you don't love life, you, you're not happy. How often does a raise really make you happy? You know? I mean, once you pay for your cell phone bill, your apartment bill, and you get food in your mouth, you're, you're pretty much taken care of. The only reason we want to get raises and promotions at work is because we want to have signs and symbols of our personal success right? It's not really about the material. We want to be loved and we want opportunity to love. That's, that's all. And that, that's how we learn to live a good and big and important life. That's the only way we're really ultimately happy. It's not, in a funny way, it's not really about the money, you know? Like once your basic needs are taken care of, it really is about, about being valued and living with dignity and uh, becoming a better person. I mean, Marxism has no, or, or socialism has no awareness of that. I mean, like I've read works of Marx, and there's no uh, awareness of our, our higher aspirations as human beings, whereas liberalism has always celebrated um, goodness and decency and um, humane values and big lives and dignified lives and spiritual achievement. The opportunity to become... Um, to live a courageous, heroic life within the framework of freedom. That's the essence of liberalism. And sadly, I think that's been for forgotten. That's exactly right. I think too often we sort of explain the virtues of free markets in terms of the, the, the vastly superior material outputs, but it's more about the things you've just talked about. Now, you wrote a book uh, a while back now called Bourbon for Breakfast. What's that all about? Do you drink bourbon for breakfast? And uh, what's the book about? Well, I've, <laughs> I've had to curb my bourbon for breakfast unfortunately <laughs> so Damn. but I, I would i would I, for a while i did gin for breakfast but even that you know at the age of 56 you have to start being careful but the, the point of the book was to rethink the world around you and it, the the title comes from a a funny breakfast i had but there's this old southern gentleman who actually happens to be a scholar in latin and greek and i went over to his house one morning and he said jeffrey it's so wonderful to have you here i was intimidated because he's a lot smarter than i am and much more old-fashioned and he said would you like some coffee and I said sure and he said would you like some bourbon with that coffee and I was triggered I thought you're not supposed to drink in the morning and then I thought maybe I can drink in the morning I said sure and I had I had that glass of bourbon and I thought it was delicious <laughs> and I enjoyed it my day went better than it ever had so after that I thought you know what I'm not gonna be bound by conventional wisdom. I'm not going to go along anymore with what the crowd tells me to believe. Like maybe certain things are true, but the, the mob and the media don't recognize it. So I wrote that entire book about things that, are, that I've found to be true that people don't know about, um, but they should. So in a funny way, that's my endur most enduring work. Um, there is an essay in there, by the way, um, about the 2006 um, avian flu pandemic that never happened. So that was my very first writing about the economics and politics of pandemics. So, <laughs> so that holds up, I actually have to say. It's good. Well, it's Fair only 7.30 here in the morning uh, in Melbourne. So there's still time for this bourbon for breakfast. I might run an experiment myself and just see over the course of this show how well I do. Uh, last question I've got for you. You are a uh, bow tie aficionado and uh, every photo of you is with a bow tie. So what does a bow tie have that ties just cannot compete with? <laughs> Thank you for asking. You know, it's the funniest thing. I was working in a men's store when I was something like 16 years old. 
And the men sort of, of course, you have to wear a fa fancy tie all the time. And then one day we got a shipment of bow ties and I thought, well, what is this? Uh, and so I didn't want to ask anybody at, this, uh, at the store at which I presently work, but I was in a, like what's called a mall in the United States. So I grabbed one of them. I went down to the competitor's store. I went to the older gentleman. I said, can you teach me how to tie this bow tie? And he did. And, and by the way, I've never forgot that man. I've, I've, I'll always be grateful to him. And he taught me how to tie it. I put it on, came back to my store. And people were like, oh, you're wearing the bow tie, huh? And I said, yeah. And from that, it was wonderful because I, I didn't have the tie flopping around me anymore. I didn't, didn't get in my way. I didn't feel the need to constantly straighten it. And then when I went to lunch and ordered soup, my tie didn't fall in. So I thought, well, you know, this, this bow tie has got a thing going on with it, you know? So after that, um, I never wore a regular tie again. <laughs> so and, and, and I, you know, the thing you have to worry about with bow ties is like once you wear them one time, it might be that, um, that you can never go back. So you'll be stuck with a lifetime persona as I am. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for that, Jeffrey. If you want to see more of Jeffrey's work, particularly on the pandemic, but on economics in general, just check out the American Institute Economic uh, American Institute of Economic Research, and also find him on Twitter. Jeffrey, thanks so much for your time. Hey, can I just say a very special word to to all of you from Melbourne? It means a lot to me that you called me tonight, and and to be in touch with you uh, right now um, is a very special experience for me. And I um, there's a funny way in which you're in the same position of many Americans uh, a few months ago. And I just want you to know that you're not alone, um, that you have many Americans thinking about you right now. And we're all in this together. This is the same struggle for all of us. Please don't give up hope. Um, don't despair. Don't despair. These are tough times for everybody. You feel alone right now, but our time is, is coming. You hang in there. You dig deep, find that inner ferocity and that inner belief in, in yourself um, and uh, never let yourself give up hope. We're going to emerge from this. Uh, uh, Australians will again travel to the United States and Americans will again travel to Australia. We will be free. We will be free again. So um, don't give up hope. Uh, wake up every day, even though life seems grim, wake up every day and say, today, I'm going to figure out how to survive until this is over. And when this is over, I will never again take my freedom for granted. I will fight for it as long as I live on this earth. So thank you for having me.